And he gave this command to his disciples, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. And in those verses, we have God's power promised. We have God's, by God's authority and power, that we're commanded to go and to evangelize and preach and to share the gospel with other people. We're taught in the Great Commission that it's not enough just to share the gospel, but we're to disciple people. We're to help them to grow and to learn the things that they ought to do. We're to help them to follow the Lord and believers' baptism and then teach them how they too should be involved in the Great Commission and sharing the gospel with the world that needs Jesus. And we lastly have a promise there that God's presence will be with us. He'll go with us if we're involved in that. This is, this is why we meet today. Some of you are, are just brand new to our church or you're just visiting even for your first time. But we are specifically emphasizing on this Sunday world missions. And we're specifically emphasizing faith promise giving for world missions. This is not a new concept. This has been around uh, for, for, for many, many decades as far as being laid out so clearly and principles being taught. But the principles that are taught we see laid out for us in the scriptures. We see grace giving taught to us in the book of, of 2 Corinthians. We read of how churches that were reached with the gospel in the book of Acts then became passionate about wanting to get the gospel to other people. And that's what we're focusing on today. That's what we're emphasizing to you. And if you're here today and you don't even know the Lord Jesus as your Savior yet, please know that we, we, we love you and God loves you and He wants you to know Jesus Christ in your life. God loves the world so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect and sinless, the Son of God. He sent Him to die. He sent Him to die, knowing He knew when He came that He would ultimately go to the cross and become the Savior of the world. He would die for man's sins. He knew He'd be rejected. He knew that He would be mocked. He knew that He'd be beaten. But He came willingly because He came to be the Savior of the world. For every teenager here, every child, every adult, every older person, uh, He came for you so you could, uh, through faith in Him, be saved and be forgiven of your sins and have the great gift of eternal life. And we want you to know that. That's the greatest truth anyone can ever know. And the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you don't understand that, I'd be so glad to talk to you about that sometime in your home or Tim Hortons or wherever you want to meet. That would be a blessing. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this. And again, ask God to speak to you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day that we can come and gather. I ask you to uh, show us, Lord, the truth this morning. Show us some, some important truth and principles from your word that would, can uh, help us uh, to be challenged and convicted and motivated to do, Lord, what you would have us to do. Lord, even this morning, I pray that you would still lay on my heart what you'd have me to do. If there's something that you want that's been different than what I've been thinking this week or what I've been praying this week, God, show that to me. I'm yours. My life is yours. Everything I have, the Lord, is yours. And I want to do your will. Help every one of us to have a heart that's yielded to you of those who already know Jesus Christ as their Savior to have a, 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 a mind and a heart for missions as we saw in Sunday school today. A heart and a mind for missions that would cause us to do what we can do to what you'd have us to do to get the gospel to other people, not just in the Toronto area, but to the ends of the earth. Speak to us and use us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning and give you some biblical principles about faith, promise, giving. Let me begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 by showing you uh, the purpose of faith, promise, giving. I'll begin by showing you the purpose of faith, promise, giving. Why do we want you to grow and increase your faith? Why do I want my own faith to grow and to be increased? Why do I want my vision for the world to increase? Why do I want my love for the, the lost to increase? Why do I want my faith to increase? Why do we want to give to this thing of world missions or world evangelism? 
2 Corinthians here in chapter 10 explains for us how a person can exercise and uh, increase their faith from year to year as they make a faith promise commitment to God uh, for world missions. And again, I say it is a commitment to God. At the end of the service, we'll give out some cards. And some of the cards are little. I do have some that are a bit bigger and give more of an explanation if you'd like that. But we, why do we make this, this commitment to God? It's because we love what God loves. We love the world. We love the souls of people. And we want them to hear the gospel. It's, it's not a pledge that you'll make to the church. It's a vow you make to God. It's a, it's a commitment you make to God. That you'll love what he loves. You'll love who he loves. And you'll seek to, to be involved in every week giving to world, world missions. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 and 16, it says, Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. The gospel had been preached in Corinth to these Corinthians because some churches in Macedonia helped to send Paul and Silas there as missionaries and to preach the gospel and to plant a church there. And the Apostle Paul, in speaking to them and trying to teach them, notice he said, I have hope. We have hope. Having hope that when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And that is really what the Faith Promise Missions Emphasis Sunday is all about. That is what Faith Promise Giving for World Missions is really all about. It is missionaries all around the world, or missionaries who are going to places all around the world, that they have this hope that when our church's faith is increased, and when Pastor Johnson's faith is increased, and when your faith is increased, that they will be able to then be enlarged by you and by your giving, to be able to go to the regions beyond you to preach the gospel. God, you see, God has called missionaries to go. We were able to have the Williams with us earlier this year, and they're going to go to Dumaguete, Dumaguete City in the Philippines. I'm sure they're having hope that, if our, fa that our faith will be increased today so that they could be enlarged by us and they could be added to our missionary family and we could help support them on a regular basis and taking the gospel to the regions beyond just York region and the regions beyond just Toronto, but to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. I'm sure Brother Harris could admit to having hope that our faith will be increased, that... We, he could be enlarged, and their family could be enlarged by us, so they can go and preach the gospel in the regions beyond us. When the faith of each individual is increased, when the faith of every church member is increased, then the church can be enlarged by our giving, and the church's ability to do more for missions will be enlarged. The church's ability to send out more missionaries will be enlarged. And, and when the church's ability is enlarged by the giving of Christians and church members, then the church can do more to preach the gospel in the regions beyond just York region. Our church can send out more preachers. Our church can plant more churches. Our church can send out more missionaries. Because the church's ability will be enlarged by the giving of the people because our faith is increased. And we say, God, I believe you can do more through me. To reach the world with the gospel. Why is it that the church could do more this year than it did last year? Well, well because the faith of the people has increased. Uh, 30 years ago, I started giving to Faith Promise Missions. 30, 31 years ago, something like that. And over all those years, my faith has grown. My faith has increased. Where now I can do what I could not do 10 years ago. I could not do 20 years ago. I could not do 30 years ago. But your faith will grow, and I encouraged you last week, start with wherever your faith is at. Your faith is small, that's fine, start there, but exercise your faith. You know what, as you exercise your faith in God, and you pray today, and you pray through this service right now, and you're whispering prayers in your heart to God, and you say, God, what would you have me to do? 
Beyond just as a Christian, you know, giving my tithes and offerings to support the church, what would you have me to do specifically for the cause of world missions and world evangelism? What could I give above and beyond my tithes and offerings to get the gospel to the world, to get the gospel to the ends of the earth, to get the gospel to Dumaguete, to get the gospel to Belize, to get the gospel to Uruguay? God, what would you have me to do? And just ask the Lord to lay something upon your heart and amount in your heart that you could do. And everyone's faith and ability is different. And God doesn't expect you to have the faith or ability that somebody else has. God doesn't expect you to have the faith or the ability to means that Pastor Johnston has or that Eric Mequa has or that Christina has. He just expects you to, he knows what ability you have. And he wants you to take your faith, wherever your faith is at, and exercise your faith in God. Because you know a wonderful thing about God? When you put your faith in Him, He's not going to let you down. When you put your faith in God, He is going to prove His great faithfulness in your life. And for over 30 years, as I've been involved in faith promise giving for world missions, God has never let me down. As God has increased my faith and enlarged what I could do for missions and what He's challenged me to do for missions, He, he has proven Himself faithful. And he's always taking care of me. The purpose of faith promise giving for world missions is not so that our church can build a new building here. There'd be nothing wrong with giving towards that cause, but that's not the purpose of faith promise giving for world missions. Faith promise giving is not offerings that will come in and, and then we'll, 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 we'll steal it. We'll, we'll pull it over aside and say, I think we could use this more instead for, for our own building. I think we could use this instead because the pastor needs a Jaguar to drive. No. That's not what it's about. Every, I was going to say every penny, but we don't have pennies. Every nickel, every dime, every dollar, everything that is given to faith, promise, world missions is used to send the gospel around the world. That's what it's all about. And it's not for us and, and building this. It's about reaching the world. Faith promise giving, it looks to the regions beyond. Faith promise giving, it looks at the needs of other cities and other provinces and other nations and other countries and other people groups. And it says, I want to get the gospel to them. Faith promise giving considers the needs of people all around the world who need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said there, having hope that when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. Turn back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That was the introduction and here's just the points of the message here this morning. I hope you'll listen with all your heart this morning and, and, and give heed to this, okay? Let me share with you some principles this morning about faith, promise, giving and grace. Faith, promise, giving and grace. Number one, faith, promise, giving is a matter of grace. Number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. I want you to remember as we read this, that the Apostle Paul was speaking to the church at Corinth, using the churches of Macedonia as an example. And it was the sacrificial giving of the Christians in the churches at Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea that helped to meet the physical needs of Paul and Silas when they traveled as missionaries into Athens and Corinth. To, to give them the gospel and to plant, try to plant churches in those places. So, so Paul uses these other churches as an example to the Corinthian church. Notice what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verses 1 through 9. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 9. Let's, let's read it aloud together. Can we do that? And we'll read it responsively. I'll read verse 1, you'll read verse 2, I'll read verse 3, you'll read verse 4 and so on, okay? Chapter 8 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. 
insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and approve the sincerity of your love. Verse 9 together. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know what word is repeated over and over a number of times in that passage? It's the word grace. 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 Grace, grace. Faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Maybe we should just call it grace giving. Because that's what it is. How thankful are you for the grace of God that saved you? How thankful are you that God in heaven loved you as a sinner and sent his son Jesus to die for you so you could receive of his grace and mercy and be forgiven and have a home in heaven and become a child of God? How thankful are you for his grace? And what will you do because of the grace of God? I believe the people whose lives have been touched by the grace of God will be givers. Look back at what it said there in verses 1 and 2. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, we, we do you to wit. We, we want you to know about. He's really saying there. We do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. You see, it was the grace of God that enabled them to do what they, what they did. It says in verse 2, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Now, verse 2 doesn't make sense to some people. Doesn't make sense at all. These were people that were going through great trials and afflictions, the Bible says, yet they had great joy. How is that possible? The grace of God. These were people, the Bible says, that they were in extreme poverty, very poor people, but they were very liberal or very generous in their giving. How is that possible? The grace of God. The grace of God. People whose lives have been touched by the grace of God uh, will be givers. So I want you to see, number one this morning, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Number two, faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Notice what it said in verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. That means they didn't just give what was in their power or ability to give. They gave beyond what was in their power or ability to give. Again, how is that humanly possible? It's not. It's only possible by faith. It's only possible by trusting God. And I believe that our faith promise offering is not just figuring out how much we can afford to give. I, I, I don't think there's necessarily something wrong with you doing that a little bit and, and being wise in that and trying to figure some things out. But I think faith stretches you beyond just what you figure out you can give. I th think faith takes it beyond where just you figure out I can budget so much or I can do this much and this is what I can really afford to do sacrificially. I think faith takes us to a realm a little bit beyond that. It pushes us beyond what we have the power to do. It pushes us beyond what we have the ability or means to do just in our own selves and our own sacrificing. It pushes us beyond to where we, we're going to do something that's going to require faith. That's going to require faith. For us here in a pl prosperous place like North America, that, that maybe has to push us a little bit further. Because all of us have some means. Uh, some of you, honestly, I, I understand you don't have much means, you would say. You'd say, I don't have much power ability to give. And I understand that. And God understands that. But compared to some of the third world countries, we have more means and power and ability than, than a lot of them would. But we, we want to make it a matter of faith. You know, your faith promise offering is, is not just us figuring out what we can do. It's praying and asking God what He wants us to do. It's not just me saying, okay, Lord, I'll do this. It's, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want? As you exercise your faith in God, you'll learn to give beyond your own ability. 
And what a wonderful area it is to live in that realm of faith. Number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Faith promise giving, can you say it with me? Faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Number two, he said faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Faith, okay? So number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. grace. Number two, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. faith. Very good. Number three, God wants us to abound in the grace of giving. God wants us to abound in the grace of giving. Notice again what it said in verse 6 and 7. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. You know, Paul says we sent Timothy to, uh, sorry, we sent uh, uh, Titus to you, to, to your church, and he's going to, you know, encourage you and teach you some things. And we want you to be abounding. We want you to be abounding in different great, uh, Christian graces and spiritual graces and so on in your life. But notice what he says, verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, abound in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, See that ye abound in this grace also. You know, Paul writes them and he says, you, you may be abounding in some other areas of the Christian life. You may be someone who's really abounding in your Bible knowledge. You, you may love to read and study the Word of God, and that's an area in your life where you're abounding. You're, you're strong in that area. You're abounding in that grace. You may be abounding in the area of diligence. Where you're someone who just, you're diligent about serving the Lord. You, you, you work hard to serve the Lord and get involved in serving the Lord. You may be abounding in various Christian graces in your life. And they're all important. But Paul challenges the church at Corinth. Let's make sure you're also abounding in the grace of giving. That's another important Christian grace in your life. Where he says, I want you to be abounding. I want you to be growing. I want you to be moving forward. I want you to be progressing. I want you to be doing well in that area. So we said, number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Number two, faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Number three, God wants us to abound in the grace of giving. God wants us to abound in the grace of giving. Number four, faith promise giving is supplied by God out of what you have. Faith promise giving is supplied by God out of what you have. Notice verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12. He says, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. The church at Corinth had previously committed themselves to say, we'll participate in an offering for the needy people back in Jerusalem, needy saints. And Paul admonishes them in, in keeping and in, in doing what they said they were going to do. But he, he said, you know, before you, you had a readiness to will, a readiness to participate. But he says, make sure you perform what, 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 what you willed to do, what you said you were going to do. And he says that performance comes what? It comes out of what you have. You know, God never expects us to give from what we don't have. He expects us to give just from what we do have, what we do have. He said there in verse 12, For if there first be a willing mind, it's accepted according to that a man hath, and, and not according to that he hath not. Do you know if, if you have one person that in their job, or whatever job, pension, whatever it may be, they only make $100 a week, or $300 a week, they won't, wouldn't have the same means or ability to do what maybe somebody who makes $800 a week or $1,000 a week or $2,000 a week or $3,000 a week, whatever, right? Because our means and ability is all different. And so God doesn't expect you to give what somebody else could give or give from what you don't have. He just expects you to, by faith, give from what you do have and what you do have. And that's going to be demonstrating faith. I want you to look with me at a great story. Turn with me back to the Old Testament. And we're going to come back to Corinthians later. But turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. The Old Testament is, is just really the, the first half of the Bible. Because it's the scriptures that were written before the time of Christ. And tells us, of course, creation and some of the Old Testament prophets and shows us the life of God's working in the life of the Hebrew people and 
King David and just many things that bring us up to the time of Christ. But I want you to notice an amazing thing that happened, an amazing story in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings chapter number 17. And look there at verse number 8. 1 Kings 17 and verse 8. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, this is Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. She says, don't, don't, don't just give me some water to drink. Give me something to eat. I'm, I'm hungry. And she said, verse 12, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. Whether it was cornmeal, flour, or some, you know, some con con combination of crushed grains that could be used for baking and cooking, making you know, pancake-type things, cake-type things, whatever. She says, I, I just have a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and, and dress it, prepare it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the, the barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. This is an amazing story. Here comes this big, bold Baptist prophet. Now, here comes Elijah. And God sends him to where there's just a poor widow woman living. And God says, I'm going to sustain you there in Zarephath. You know, God wanted to do something amazing in that widow woman's life. To grow her faith, to increase her faith, to show her that God is faithful and God is good and God would take care of her. And so God sends him particularly there. It's like a missionary going to church that all they have is a few people showing up for church and a couple of them are these old widow ladies and they, they don't have much. And the missionary, will you support our missions to Belize? <laughs> the missionary probably feels like maybe I should support these widows, right? But the preacher comes and would you support us as missionaries to Belize? Would you pray? That's kind of what Elijah was doing, right? In his boldness, he's... Get me some water, please. But can you make me something to eat, too? And she says, but, 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 sir, Mr. Prophet, I, I only have a little. Me and my boy, me and my son were all alone. My husband's died. All we have left is, is really our last meal. We were planning that today, I was planning that I would probably cook the very last that we have, and then we die after that. We have nothing else, nothing to sustain us. And the prophet says, go and do as thou hast said, but would you first make a cake for me first? And she decides to, okay, trust the Lord. The prophet says, the word of the Lord, he'll not fail you. He'll take care of you. She says, I don't know, I don't know about this, but okay, I'll trust the Lord. I'll have faith. And so she takes and she makes a, a small cake for Elijah makes a small cake for her and for her son, and they eat. And it's the last that she scraped out of the barrel. It's the last oil that she had in the, in the jar. Well, the next morning, the boy wakes up, and he's playing. But after a little while, he gets hungry. And he comes running to mom at the house and says, Mama, Mama, I'm hungry. What, when are we going to eat breakfast? And mama says, Son, you, you know we, we didn't have any more. We used the very last we had yesterday. The little boy's a little sad, but he starts to walk away. And he goes over to where that barrel was. 
of the meal, flour, whatever you want to say. And he, he, maybe he's a short boy, I don't know, when he gets up on his tippy toes, he peeks over into the edge of that barrel, and he says, Mama, Mama, there, there, there's a little more flour in here. There's a little more cornmeal in here. And he looks at the cruise of oil and says, Mama, there, there's a little oil in there. I, I think we can have some breakfast. I think we can eat again. And she comes running over, and sure enough, there's a little more meal and oil. Elijah stayed with them several days. The Bible doesn't tell us how long, but he stayed with them several days. You know what? Over and over again, every day, God sustained her. The Bible doesn't say that the barrel got filled, but you know what? God sustained her. And though she had used her last, and though she gave out of the very little that she had, and okay, I'll trust God, I'll, I'll honor God, I'll, I'll do what He's asked me to do, she continued meal by meal, day by day, to feed Elijah first, and to feed her and her son, and God sustained her, and God took care of her needs. Can you imagine that widow woman if she ever got to go to town and talk to the ladies? Girls, you won't believe what God's been doing. You won't believe what God has done. I had nothing, but every day God's been taking care of me. The prophet came, the man of God came, and every day he's been taking care of me. And it's amazing. She had stories to tell now because she saw her faith in God growing and increasing. She saw God's faithfulness being proved in her life. Because though she didn't have much, and she only had a little, when God said, I want you to give this, she gave first out of what she had. had. And boy, God proved his faithfulness. And God continued to sustain her and take care of her. Boy, when we give out of what we have, God, God can multiply what we have left over. When we learn to tithe, God can take care of us better with the 90% that He lets us keep than if we would have kept all of it to ourselves. When we learn to go beyond the tithe and to give offerings or, or to give faith promise offerings for world missions, God can multiply what remains and He can continue to bless us and meet our needs. And He, he doesn't promise necessarily He'll make you rich, but I believe with all my heart that He will sustain you and He'll meet your needs. And you say, I, I don't have much. That's fine. Whatever ability you have, if you, can you take a little measure of faith that you have and place it in God, that if He lays on your heart something to do, you'll do it and say, God, you've got to take care of me. This is beyond what I even think I can afford to do or have an ability to do, but God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to give it because I, I, I want to have a heart for missions. I want to have a mind to reach the world with the gospel, so God, I'll give it and I'll trust you to take care of me. When you make your faith promise, your faith commitment to God, I keep that promise, do it. God accepts what we do have. He doesn't expect us to give what we don't have. And when we give what we have, we're exercising our faith and trust in God to put, take care of us and to provide our needs. I said, number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Number two, faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Number three, faith, uh, God wants us to abound, abound in the grace of giving. It should be an area where we're growing and abounding and flourishing as Christians in the grace of giving. Number four, faith promise giving is supplied by God out of what you have. What you have. Number five, faith promise giving proves your love and thankfulness for God's saving grace. Number five, faith promise giving, it proves your love for God and your thankfulness uh, for Jesus Christ. It proves your love and thankfulness for God's saving grace. Look back with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I want you to see again those amazing verses. Wonderful verses in scriptures. Paul encouraged the church here at Corinth to prove the sincerity of their love. Beginning there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 8 he said... I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. He's saying, when, when I talk to you about giving this offering, it, it's not something I can give by commandment and say, this is what you have to do, must do, should do exactly this. When it comes to a, a preacher trying to teach the Bible and teach about tithing, we can say this is what the Bible shows us and commands us as Christians. But when it comes to offerings and, and, and faith promise offerings and so on, it's all a matter of something between you and God, between your heart and God, what God lays upon your heart to do. 
It's not something that we can say by commandment, this is what you ought to do. We can say you ought to pray about it. We can say we ought to do something. We, we, we know that. But what you should do, that's between you and God. That's totally between you and God. And he says, I challenge you because of the, the example of others. That's what he was saying. The example of the Macedonian Christians who just, they gave so generously, even though they were in deep poverty. And he says, I want you to prove the sincerity of your love. But notice what verse 9 says. That's the amazing part. Verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Paul reminds the church here about the grace giving of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he left all the riches and glories and splendors of heaven. He left his spot at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And he came down to live in a, in a sin-cursed world. He came down to live among sinful men. And even though Jesus Christ was sinless, even though he was perfect, he would give his life, he would die on the cross for sinners like me. So that I can be forgiven, so that I can be saved. Oh, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for my sake he became poor, so that me, through his poverty, could be made rich in Christ. Oh, the blessings that I have because of the grace giving of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I challenge you this morning to prove the sincerity of your love. And I encourage you to make a faith promise commitment that shows your thankfulness for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your thankfulness for what the Lord Jesus has done for you. I said, number one, faith promise giving is a matter of grace. Number two, faith promise giving is a matter of faith. Number three, God wants you to abound in the grace of giving. It's a Christian grace that we ought to be growing in. Number four, faith promise giving is supplied by, uh, by God out of what you have, not what you don't have. Number five, faith promise giving proves your love and thankfulness for God's saving grace. And lastly, I say this, number six, faith promise giving should be done with, with generous hands and a cheerful heart. Faith promise giving should be done with generous hands and a cheerful heart. A cheerful heart. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 9. Maybe turn over one page, possibly, depending on your Bible there. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verses 6, 7, and 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6, 7, and 8. He says, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly, a little, shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. Every, and it compares your giving to sowing and reaping. You sow a little, you'll reap a little. You sow a lot, you'll reap a lot. But he says in verse 7, Every man, every woman, every teenager, every child, right? Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly. Not, ah, oh, pastor's going to make me. No, don't give. If that's your whole attitude, please don't give to missions. Pay your tithe like a grump, but don't give to missions because God doesn't want you to be grumpy in doing it. He doesn't want you to be grudging about it, right? He doesn't want you to have an angry heart or spirit. So he says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. He says in verse 6, uh, don't, 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 don't do your giving with, 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 with tight hands, with a closed fist, with your hand gripping your wallet as tightly as possible. I don't want any more to fall out of there than necessary. He says, don't have that heart. Have generous hands. Have a cheerful heart. That, that's all. Generous hands and a cheerful heart. Oh, it's a blessing to give generously and cheerfully to faith promise giving for world missions. Because God will, he'll meet your needs. 
when you exercise your faith and trust in Him, He'll not let you down. His grace will prove itself sufficient. Uh, God will take care of you. I, I've seen God do that. For, for poor people, for widow people, for teenagers, college students. God is faithful. God is faithful. Brother Abair, yeah, let me get you to help me here, and uh, Eric Mikwa. Stevie, you want to help me there? Caleb. I want to give to all those who, who want one and want to just pray about participating. I have these, I guess I call them a smaller card here, but it has our missions theme on it to the ends of the earth. On the back of it, it says, realizing my responsibility to spread the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth. I promise the Lord that over the next year in faith and dependence upon God, I'll give the following amount each week for the World Missions Program of Gospel Light Baptist Church. And it just gives a blank and, and says dollars per week and today's date. It says I'm a child, teen, adult. You could check that. But there's no place for your name because nobody's going to try to come and collect it from you. Be a promise you'd make to the Lord. Say, Lord, I want to have a heart for world missions. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. Let's spend a moment in prayer. Can we do that? And hopefully many of you have already been praying recent weeks and especially this week uh, about what the Lord would have us to do. I'm going to ask the pianist to play. And I want you to pray. Lord, what do you want? And again, th th these cards were not intended to be given out to our, our, our first-time visitors and all that. You may not understand all this. But for those of us who are saved, for those of us who are born again, you ought to have a heart full of gratitude and thankfulness for the grace of God that has saved you, that has given you new life in Jesus Christ. And so to those who are saved and born again, and you, you attend our church regularly, you've made this your church. Ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Ask the Lord to lay on your heart what you could give that might stretch your faith. That might even seem a little bit beyond what you really have the power or ability to do. And God's not looking for you to do what he's asking somebody else to do. God understands your means and your ability and what you have. And God sees your faith. Whatever size faith you have right now, that, that's fine. But would you pray and say, God, would you take from what I have, would you take what faith I have, and Lord, help me to do what you want me to do. And ask God maybe to lay an amount on your heart that you can give to faith, promise, giving for world missions, for world evangelism over the next year. That you'll decide, Lord, I'm going to do this this year. Every week I'm going to do this. It's not going to take the place of my tithes and offerings to support the church, but I'm going to give by faith to support world missions, world evangelism, so that the gospel can be preached in the regions beyond. Spend this time in prayer, and as you feel the Lord allowing you to, would you write down on that card an amount that you would believe the Lord would have you to give, and that you would cheerfully give it to the Lord for the cause of world missions, world evangelism, so that other people can hear about Jesus Christ and hear the gospel, so that others could have the opportunity to be saved. So churches could be planted around the world.
Maybe I need you to give me one of those. consecrate our lives to you we consecrate our hearts to you I'm here to say Lord that I, I give myself to you I want to be like those uh, Macedonian Christians who first gave their self to the Lord their own selves to the Lord Father I want you to have me all of me all of this life you've given me I want to serve you faithfully I want you to use my life to be the witness for Christ that you want it to be. Father, I want you to take from the resources that you've given to me. And I want you to use it for your purpose, for your glory, for your cause, for your mission. Lord, we consecrate ourselves and these commitments to you, Lord. I pray you'd help every one of us to have a growing and increasing faith from year to year. I pray, Lord, that you would do mighty things through this, your church, through the World Missions Program of this church. Help us to do all that you would have us to do to get the gospel out, both in our Jerusalem, in this area, but also to the ends of the earth. Bless the faith of every child, every teenager, every man, every lady who purposefully and personally determines to get involved in world missions. And Lord, bring us to a place one day where every Christian, every man, every lady, every teenager, even every child would have a heart and mind to reach the world with the gospel. Lord, this is not for me. This is not for us. This is not for our church. Lord, this is for you. This is for your work, for your mission. God, help us and use us. Uh, we consecrate these to you and help us, Lord, to be faithful in the, the performing of it, in the doing of it, in keeping our commitment to you, Lord. Increase and grow our faith as we make these promises to you today. And uh, show your faithfulness in our lives week by week. Help us to be like that widow woman and to keep putting you first and to see your greatness and faithfulness in, in sustaining us, taking care of us.